to hear the truth and would it change us? Amen. So I want to start off with a, a question then. So we're, we're focusing in on Acts 16, verse 11 to 15, if you've got your Bibles. But before we get into the passage, I want to ask you a question. What do you do when things seem to be going wrong? I mean, we heard in that, that song that we just sang, you know, when the darkness closes in. And if we're honest, that, that happens a lot in our lives, doesn't it? What, have a think for a moment. What do you do? How do you react when things seem to go wrong in your life. Well, to change the tone slightly, um, Ronan Keating was right. For any of you who are 90s kids or, or parents of 90s kids, Ronan Keating, the singer, said, life is a roller coaster. You know what? He was right. I'm not going to sing the rest. You, you would not appreciate that. Um, but it's true, isn't it? Life is a roller coaster. One minute we're on a, on a high, and the next minute we seem to be plummeting back to earth with a bump. Life seems to take twists and turns, and many of them just don't seem to make sense to us, if we're honest. But the thing with roller coasters is that they always end up where the designer intended them to be. There may be twists and turns along the way, but the designer knows where he wants that roller coaster to end. And Paul and Silas in our passage this morning are probably feeling like they're on a bit of a roller coaster. They're feeling like they're on a roller coaster that's sort of taken suddenly a dramatic, unexpected turn. But gradually, gradually, as we work our way through Acts and through this passage today, we're going to begin to see what God is actually doing. So first of all, we're going to just recap what we've been looking at the last uh, few weeks now. Uh, this map on the screen is a map of um, Paul's first and second, first and second missionary journeys. Um, and up until this point in the, uh, the account of Acts, we, we've seen Paul and Barnabas go on their first missionary journey. And then they've, they've gone to Jerusalem, and they've met with the elders and the leaders in Jerusalem and the apostles. And they've discussed the whole issue of circumcision, of whether, whether the Gentiles, the non-Jews, uh, must, be, must be circumcised or not. And following this, this high, really, we're faced with Paul and Barnabas having a massive row which we heard about last week. They disagree over whether to take Mark with them on their missionary journey, and it's such a bad row that they actually part ways. Barnabas and Mark take a boat down to Cyprus, and Paul and Silas go in the opposite direction across land. They travel north and then, and then west. And as they're traveling, natural human wisdom probably would have um, led them to think that they should be sort of preaching the gospel, telling the good news about Jesus in all the cities that they're passing through. But that's not quite how it works out. Instead, we see in our passage that the Holy Spirit directs them on a 400-mile journey by foot to a place called Troas in the top left-hand corner. I've probably got a laser on here, but I don't want to blind any of you, so I'm not going to try it. So that's where we meet them today. And at Troas, they're, they're, um, by, by this point, Paul and Silas have been joined by Timothy and by Luke. So there's at least four of them by this point. And they're in Troas, and they're a bit, in a bit of a dilemma. And so now in verse 11, uh, we meet them at the port of Troas. Now, they've been prevented up until this point from preaching in Asia um, so you can see the red line. So they've been, been prevented from going south and, and preaching in the towns there. So they try to go north to uh, Bithynia, if I've pronounced that right. But they couldn't, can't go there for some reason. We're not told why. So by this point, they're probably feeling really frustrated and thoroughly confused. So they end up in this port, Troas. And whilst they're at Troas, Paul receives a vision of a man from Macedonia urging them to come, in verse 9 and 10. Now, up until this point, the gospel, the good news about Jesus, has only been spread in the east. So as they look out across the water towards Macedonia, this is uncharted territory. This is Europe. It's a different part of the world where the gospel has not reached yet. They've been driven west by the crosswinds of failure and rejection. 
But we find out in in this passage today that God is guiding them to where he wants them to be. Failure and frustration actually turn out to be God's guiding hand. He has put them right where he wants them. So they set off from Troas, they take a boat, and immediately they're making good progress. They stop briefly at the island of Samothrace, which is basically, you can sort of see it up there, sort of a dot just above the T of Troas. And basically this is a halfway point. They stop there just to sort of put their anchor down um, and uh, stay there overnight to avoid the dangers of sailing at night. And from Samothrace, they, they, it's smooth sailing again up to Neap- Neapolis, the, um, the port up there on the top left. And from Neapolis, they have an eight-mile walk inland to the city of Philippi. And it's, it's quite revealing, actually. Take, take a look at verse 11. We're told that they, make, they made a direct voyage to Samothrace, it says in my, in my version. And that, that, those words, a direct voyage to Samothrace, are quite revealing. Because this is a nautical expression, which means the wind was at their backs. The wind was behind them. They'd just done a 156-mile journey in two days. The wind was behind them. God was propelling them forwards. God had a purpose for them. So we come to verse 12, and they've arrived at Philippi in the top left. So they've walked inland to Philippi. Well, what is Philippi? What was Philippi? What was it like? Well, Philippi was a city that lay on the Via, um, again, I'm going to try and pronounce this, Via Ignatia, the Ignatian Way, basically, which was basically the main east-west route across Macedonia, linking Rome with its eastern provinces and and towns like, or cities like Philippi. Now, Philippi sat in a, a prosperous and fertile region. There were local mines, especially gold mines, that made that city rich. And it was also, and we're told in the passage, it was a Roman colony. Now, I think Luke, the writer, tells us that for a reason. It gives us an idea of what this place was like. Roman colonies had a privileged status. They were self-governing. They were run on Roman principles and laws. Roman soldiers were encouraged to uh, retire there. And Roman citizenship, which, which Paul had, was highly prized. It's basically like a mini Rome, like a mini sort of Greco-Roman culture. But before we go on, it's worth just taking a step back and considering their journey so far. Because what on the surface has seemed to be failure, frustration, discouragement, has ended up being God's divine guidance. Paul and Barnabas have had a massive bust-up. They've had a big public argument, and they've gone their separate ways. Paul and Silas try to reach, uh, sorry, reach Asia and preach in Asia and uh, uh, Bithynia, but they're prevented for some reason. This is what they're meant to be doing, isn't it? Everything must have been, seemed like it was falling apart at that point. But God was guiding them to Philippi. God was guiding them to Philippi to plant the flag of the gospel on the frontiers of the Roman colony. Remember, Rome was the superpower of that day. And we, in in hindsight, now know that less than 300 years later, Christianity and the gospel had spread across the whole of the known world via the Roman Empire. It is how we in Britain heard about Christianity. It's how we are sitting here today having heard the gospel. God had a plan. So what at first seemed like failure and and closed doors wherever they looked was actually God's guiding hand to spread the gospel to the rest of the known world. I think the lesson, before we move on, the lesson for us is this, I think. When things seem to be going wrong, when we face barriers and failures, and we're tempted to, to question God, what do we do? Do we give up? Don't 
underestimate what God might be doing when things seem to be going wrong. God works in the messiness of our lives for his glory. Let's move on to verse 13 and 14. I'm going to read it out just to remind us of where we are. So verse 13 and 14 in my translation say this. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. In verse 13 and 14, we see God's sovereignty in salvation. But first, notice something. Notice how Paul follows his usual pattern. What does he do when he goes to a new place? Well, what we hear again and again throughout Acts is he goes to the local synagogue. He tries to find the local Jews. You know, at the end of the day, Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism. So that a good place to start is to start with the Jews and explain how Jesus has fulfilled their scriptures. So that's what he does. He tries to find the Jews, but there's a problem here. According to Jewish tradition, to have a synagogue in a city or a town, you had to have at least 10 male heads of households. And if not, if you couldn't find 10 male Jewish heads of households, then the Jews would meet outside under the open air near a river or a sea. And on top of that, in a Roman colony like, um, like Philippi, foreign religions or foreign cults, especially small ones, were often not allowed to be practiced within the city walls. And that's exactly what Judaism would have been viewed as uh, by the, the Philippian governors and, and the Roman officials. So Paul goes looking for a synagogue. He goes looking for the Jews, but all he can find is a small group of women gathered to pray by a river outside the city walls. On the surface of it, perhaps this doesn't seem like a promising start. Perhaps this doesn't seem like the best place to start when you're trying to spread the good news about the Messiah that's been preached and promised in the Jewish scriptures when there's no Jews. We find no synagogue and not even any men mentioned, just a small group of women. And remember, women at that time were often looked down on as second-class citizens. This is not a promising start, is it? But again, God is working. In verse 14, we're introduced to a woman named Lydia. She's a businesswoman. She's probably a wealthy widow. Um, She runs a a lucrative business selling purple clothing. Now, the the process of dyeing purple clothes was expensive. You had to do something special with shellfish, I'm told. Uh, But it was expensive. So only royalty and perhaps the sort of mega rich would be wearing purple. So she is portrayed as part of the elite. She has some social standing and certainly some means here. And like Cornelius, we're told that she is a worshipper of God, which means that she wasn't a convert to to Judaism. She wasn't what's called a proselyte, uh, but she was someone who recognized the importance of the God of the Jews and worships him. So in this most unlikely of places, God has been preparing this woman, Lydia, to hear and believe the gospel. And we know that because we're told in verse 14, God opened her heart to pay attention to what was said. Isn't this a wonderful picture of what evangelism is? God has chosen those who will respond. We're told in in Acts chapter 13 that as as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. It is God's choice to initiate salvation in someone's heart. He causes the change. He is the one who initiates the change in someone's heart. And we're told here that God was the one who had prompted Lydia 
to listen to what Paul was saying, to pay attention. It, it reminds me of the parable of the soils the, or the parable of the sower that, that Jesus set the tells in, in Matthew. Lydia was ready to hear the truth, wasn't she? Like that good soil, she, she was ready to let the seed of God's word be planted in her heart and flourish. She was ready. God had made her ready. But that's not all. God also used Paul to bring her the truth. Without Paul traveling those hundreds of miles and having that vision of a Macedonian man beckoning him to come across the water, she may never have heard the gospel. The truth is evangelism is is not just about us and it's not just about God. It is both. Paul spoke God opened. Paul had to speak the truth to Lydia. But God had to open Lydia's heart to listen. God wants you and I to tell others about the good news about Jesus. Without opening our mouths, many people that we know or come into contact with may never know the truth about Jesus. They will live in darkness for their whole lives. But remember, we are not responsible for changing hearts. We are responsible for opening our mouths. God is in the business of changing hearts. We must speak. Let God change hearts. I find this incredibly encouraging, really, because it makes clear what our responsibility is. My responsibility is not to convince people that this is the truth. My responsibility is to tell them the truth. God will work in their hearts. So whilst Paul was struggling with a painful separation with a good friend, obstacles everywhere he looked, his plans just not working out. Meanwhile, God is guiding him towards Lydia. Lydia, whose heart God was preparing to hear what Paul was going to tell her. I think the question for us is, do we expect God to be working through all of the ups and the downs of life to use us to spread the gospel, to spread the good news, to build up his church? There are no coincidences in God's plan. God is working. So that brings us then to verse 15. And we see here that God starts with small beginnings. And again, I find this wonderfully encouraging. You see, I'm going to read verse 15. After she was baptized, and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. And we'll come back to that in a moment. She prevailed upon us. You see, Lydia gives us a wonderful illustration of how saving faith should impact our lives. How saving faith should change how we behave. First, she's obedient. She immediately obeys the command to be baptized. There's no hint of hesitation here, that she doesn't hide her newfound faith away from others. She is ready to publicly declare her allegiance to Jesus. Secondly, her joy overflows to those around her. The change in her life clearly influences those around her. We're told that her household believe and are baptized as well. Now, her household probably refers to her family members who are living with her and probably a whole bunch of servants as well. Remember, she's a wealthy woman. Does our faith, our joy at knowing Jesus, overflow and impact those around us like Lydia's did? If it doesn't, what is going on? And third, Lydia gets to work, doesn't she? We see in in the latter part of verse 15 here that she immediately commits her resources 
to the work of spreading the good news and building up the church. I love this. It makes me smile. She, she doesn't just offer hospitality politely to Paul and the gang, does she? she it, it tells us here, she prevailed upon us. She insisted. She insisted that she be allowed to serve them by providing somewhere where they could stay and probably some food for them to eat as well. She was not taking no for an answer. She was a, a force to be reckoned with, Lydia. Do we have that kind of attitude? Do we have that kind of attitude towards serving other believers and to building up the church? Do we have that attitude to how we use what we have, the resources we have? Most of us, I'd say probably all of us, have plentiful resources in this country. How do we use them? Do we use them like Lydia used them? How have we committed our resources, our time, our abilities to serve God's people and to see his church grow? So this passage here, that the church in Philippi starts from humble beginnings, doesn't it? A small number of women meeting outside the city by a river to pray. But if for any of you who've read the rest of the New Testament and read the book of Philippians, you may remember a few things. That this small group of believers ended up being one of the churches that was one of Paul's most beloved congregations. Later, Paul talks about the Philippian church like this. He says in Philippians 1, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, in every prayer of mine for you all, for you all sorry, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. He goes on in Philippians 4 to say, when I left Macedonia... No church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. He thanks God for the Philippians. So in a place where Paul never intended to go, this wasn't part of his plan. There was no established synagogue here. There was no sort of established Jewish presence here. Just a a group of women praying by a river. God establishes a church. A church who would go on to become one of Paul's most valued partners in the gospel. This is encouraging. God is in the business of taking humble beginnings, humble circumstances, small beginnings, and doing great things for his glory. And I guess where this hits home for us is, When you look at our church here, when you look around at each other here, what do you see? Do you see a small group of Christians? Because we we are small. And recently, over the last two years, on some weeks, it's been very small. A small group of believers with modest gifts and modest resources. What can we do? Or... Do you see what God can do through us in this area? Do you see what God can do to change the lives of the people we come in contact with? Just imagine what God can do through the faithful sharing of the good news and the demonstration of that through our lives, through the people that we know and come into contact with in this area. We need to be careful not to be complacent. We need to be careful not to underestimate what God can do through churches like ours, through small beginnings, through humble circumstances. But are we willing to be like Lydia? Are we willing to be obedient? Are we willing to influence those around us? And are we willing to serve, to put all of our resources in his hands to see what he can do with them. Small beginnings. So, so far we've, we've heard about the journey, the unexpected journey in some ways. We've heard about God's 
sovereignty in salvation. And we've seen what God can start doing through small beginnings. So in summary, we, we've started with, at the start of this passage, we, we started with Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke in that, in that place, Troas, up, up the top left-hand corner. Confused, downbeat, frustrated. Their plans had not worked out and they couldn't understand why. Paul had experienced a, a rift in a valued friendship. They were confused at what God was doing. But all along, God was working through their circumstances, good and bad, to spread the good news. And all along, he was preparing hearts to hear that good news. He was preparing people like Lydia to hear and respond to the gospel. And through the faithful response of people like Lydia, through, from small beginnings, God did great things. But remember, this is not a, a one-off. If you're familiar with the Bible, like this is not a one-off. This is a pattern we see again and again, isn't it? Right back into the Old Testament. God works through humble beginnings. He often works through things seemingly going wrong for his glory. I mean, the ultimate example of this is the shock, the disappointment, the devastation of the disciples when their leader, their teacher, their master was humiliated, was arrested, was executed. They must have felt like the world had turned upside down. But through that situation, God was doing the greatest act in history. It was through what looked like a failure that he was saving humankind. Don't underestimate what God can do through your so-called failures. So when we face disappointment or all seems lost, don't lose hope. God is working to build his kingdom. When you look around at our church, our community, our lives, do you see failure and barriers? Or do you trust in the God who works through every situation, every circumstance, to build his kingdom? Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for this passage. Thank you for this reminder that failure and rejection and things not going to plan is nothing new. The great apostle Paul experienced this firsthand. He probably would have felt many of the same emotions that we feel when life seems to be upside down. But Lord, thank you for the reminder that you are a God who is working through every circumstance for the good of those who love you. You are working to build your church, come what may. Lord, you have people in our lives, in our community, in our families, in our friendship groups, who you are preparing their hearts to hear the good news. Help us to have the courage to tell them. And leave it up to you to change their hearts. And Lord, remind us that you work through small beginnings to do great things. Thank you for the example of the Philippian church, Lord. That started with just a ragtag bunch of, of women meeting outside of the city. To be one of Paul's greatest and most valued partners in the gospel. Help us not to underestimate you, Lord. Amen. I'm going to invite the uh, musicians up now um, to lead us in a, a last song.